Good evening, guys. I, uh, good evening, everybody out there on the interwebs and in the world out there. As you know, as you can see, I'm obviously not Chris Dwelly. Those here already know that. Uh, my name... <laughs> We're giving Chris a break tonight. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Phil Jackson, and if uh, you are so inclined to want of a titles, I am uh, the vice president of this fine church here, uh, Victor Becker Church, Maine. Um, one of the founding few, the original four that have kind of come together to try to get this church off the ground and uh, take off and do God's work. Um, so about five or six week ago, weeks ago, we, uh, as the founding few, the first original four came together, we were trying to figure out where we wanted to go, kind of had an impromptu leaders meeting, trying to figure out where, what direction we wanted to take the church in, and we kind of came across some different aspects and things that we wanted to pass on. Um, a couple weeks ago, I think you all heard my wife, uh, Donlin, she spoke about, uh, excuse me, worship. Um, Chris, obviously Pastor Chris is speaking, and his wife also spoke. Um, guess what? It's my turn. So I get to uh, take on the honorary title of talking about tithing. And everybody said, yay! <laughs> so... <clears throat> This is kind of thrust upon me, sort of. I, uh, I, I, this was a given sort of task. And I said yes. So here I am. Um, little did I know what I was getting myself into. Folks, the idea of tithing and the whole aspect of tithing and giving that goes along with this is huge. I mean, it, it, it is all throughout the scriptures, all throughout the Bible. It is a subject that I could talk on for weekly basis for months. It's its own sermon series. Yeah, feel free. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, I got a couple things to ask you for. Obviously, your time, which you're obviously giving now. Thank you. I appreciate that, your attention. But since this is my first time preaching a sermon for Victory Biker Church, and in fact, ever, um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of an abundance of grace. So, here we go. So I do not have a PowerPoint today, so you get to hear me talk. And everybody said, yay. So <clears throat> I want to set a tone for the sermon with a statement that I read in my research. And also a little bit about what this sermon is not. So there was a gentleman out there, uh, his name, who's now I'm going to forget, it was his first name, not his last name. Uh, I think it was Mike, maybe, I don't remember. Mike, if this is for you, I can't give you any credit, but that's all I can give you because you didn't give me your last name. A, the Christian who walks after the Spirit and not after the flesh will never coerce people into giving their money for anything. A Christian who walks after the Spirit and not after the flesh will never coerce people into giving their money for anything. So that's the tone I want to set. A couple of things this is not about. This is not about coercing you, obviously, into giving. This is not what this is about. It's not about convincing you or any other Christian to be cheap or excuse those who are reluctant to give into giving. And it's not about giving a freedom not to give. You'll understand that maybe a little bit more as we get forward. So, I also, uh, I want to jump into basically what is tithing. And in the interest of time, because like I said, this is a huge subject, this is going to be short. I'm going to give you a background and a little history very quickly. So when I say tithing, what do you guys think of? Somebody give me their thought and definition. What is tithing? What is it? Giving back to God. Giving back to God? Good. What, what your first okay. So giving back to God your first fruits. For those of you who didn't hear that on the, out, out on the internet. Anybody else? Anyone? Anyone? That's good. There's no right or wrong answer that I'm looking for. I'm just looking at kind of where you guys are at. So a very first definition. First of all, tithing is defined specifically as a tenth of something. It's not a specific, it's a tenth of something. That's the word defined. <clears throat> so the first evidence that we get about that tenth comes from Genesis. It's 1420. Um, and Melchizedek, Melchizedek, sorry, king of Salem brought forth bread and wine and, was, and he was the priest of the most high God and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram, Abraham, of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him, meaning Abraham to Melchizedek, and gave him tithes of all. 
That's the first indication that we see of that. Again, I told you I'm going to go through this quick. We see it again, Genesis 20, 20, 28, sorry, 20 to 22, talking about Jacob. Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and all that shall give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. I just put my headers in. There you go. Moving forward a little bit more. Probably where most people start to really kind of recognize the idea of the tithe. It's in the Mosaic Law. It's Mount Sinai. Moses gets the Ten Commandments. He gets the law. He gets the law that guides the Israelites. And in Mosaic Law, the tithe, very specifically, a tithe was giving 10% of one's increase from crops grown in the land of Israel or cattle that fed off the land of Israel. So, breaks it down a little further, something I really wasn't aware of because I've never really reached into this. There are three kinds. Yep, sorry, I'm going to speak up a little bit. Apparently, I'm fading away. <laughs> For those on the internet, I apologize, I'll try to speak up. So there's three different tithes. Levitical tithe. That's a commandment from God to the tribes of Israel for the support of the Levites. Tribes of Israel, they, got, they, got, they, they received their inheritance. They received the land on the River Jordan. Each one of them did, except Levites did not. Their inheritance, their inheritance was God. They were bound to the temple, if you will, for lack of a better way to put it. And they were given the authority to collect tithes. So the Levitical tithe. Festival tithes was another one, a collection of resources. There are three festivals in, the, in Judaism, Passover, the Feast of the Tabernacles, and the Pentecost, or the Festival of Weeks, is another way that it was said. They collected food, cattle, resources to be able to present these festivals, which were uh, feasts to remember who God was and what he had done for, uh, for all of them. And that was done on a yearly basis. And then the charity tithe that was designed as a blessing for the Levites, specifically as well as the poor, the widowed, the fatherless, those who were less fortunate. And that was something they did every three years. So <clears throat> the law has been established and defines what tithing is. So again, I'm going to cover a massive amount of time. 1,600 years pass. That is the law. And then this guy comes along. Spoiler alert, we've been talking about him a lot. Jesus. <clears throat> Folks, I had five weeks to put this together, roughly. I started fairly early, bits and pieces, doing some research, trying to figure it out, figuring out what I wanted to say, trying to put a message together. I got to the New Testament. And I'm not going to lie. Actually, I, I got to Wednesday. Okay? This Wednesday. If my computer were a piece of paper, I would have crumpled it up, thrown it in the fire, and watched it burn. Because pretty much everything I put together was absolutely frustrating. It was not where I wanted to go. It wasn't even where I was pulled to go. I got to the New Testament. And as we know, or if you don't know, Jesus was put on the cross. His last words, it is done. I am correct. The law had been fulfilled. I'm probably making some people a little nervous right now. Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe they're a little bit like, where are you going with this, Phil? This is where I hit the wall. There are two very different divides in Christianity about the tithe. One side says that the tithe is something that remains, it's something that we're still bound to, if you will, that it is something that moves all through the New Testament and something that we should be doing today. The other side has this opinion and said that the law has been fulfilled and we no longer are bound we are no longer required to give. Required to give. I want to make sure you hear that. Folks, I'm going to step down off the teaching platform for a second 
and come at you from the perspective of a new Christian, something I hope that I always remain as a new Christian. I can't say that I am qualified to answer that question. And you know what? For five weeks of looking in the Bible, in the internet, and anywhere else you can find, there's a lot of people out there that aren't qualified to answer that question. I walked both sides of the line. I looked at both pieces. And I got more and more frustrated. I was just ready to pop. I had one side of the wall saying, using one scripture, and the other side of the aisle using the other, same scripture, and both of them using it to either prove themselves right or take down the other's opinion. Where am I going to go with that? I didn't know where to go. So uh, needless to say, a lot of gnashing of teeth, trying to figure out. I had to take a step back. Folks, I know where I rest. I have had conversations for five weeks with myself, with God, looking at the Bible. I can't answer that question for everybody. That's not my rule. It's not my job. I truly believe in my spiritual core that I understand the answer for myself. And for me, I came to a point where I was asking myself, am I really asking the right question? I kept coming to this piece, I felt like I am way down in the weeds trying to figure this out. So I came here initially to talk about tithes. And I kind of find myself moving off into a little bit different direction, for lack of a better term. I searched and I kept coming to this place where I kept feeling like I was missing a bigger point. That point that, be, that by our very nature, based on the mantle that we have voluntarily accepted in becoming Christians, that we've entered a willing agreement to be Christ-like. Let me explain that for a second. Let me not explain that, but let me put another question out to you. I challenge you for a question. Is anybody here able to come up and pass present, or if you have the power of the future, to determine any person that you can feel or find is more giving than Jesus Christ? Me either. <laughs> It is not a trick question. You got it right. At least from where, I, where, where, I, where I've, I've gone in this whole journey. Can a Christian defined as to be a follower of Jesus Christ and follow his teachings. How can we not, regardless of the title that we give to this, a tithe, giving, and I'm talking about giving as an umbrella, not the specifics of giving. The specifics of giving is a sacrifice. It's a giving of more or giving further. This idea of just giving, giving of yourself, giving back to God. <clears throat> Regardless of what side we come down on this aspect of tithing, how can we say that we're Christians and not be givers? Because we are. It's the core, it's one of the core pieces of who we are. It's one of the core aspects of Jesus in, in, in his gospel. I mean, let's face it, he gave everything. I'm going to throw myself on the fire. I'm going to tell you where I rest. I think you probably might know walking on which side of the wall I fall. We have a freedom in the new covenant of grace to give as we are, I don't even find the word anymore, as we have ability to do so. Not specifically. God, in the Mosaic Law, gave us specifics. He took what we needed to do and made it, codified it into a finite law that said, this is what you need to do. You need to give a tenth of your fruits 
so on and so forth, and all the bits and pieces below it, all the finite details. He took away the responsibility. We didn't have to do anything, or they didn't have to do anything. Where I rest is on that Mosaic law having been fulfilled. Guess what? Now it's up to us. We now have a responsibility for our giving through a personal conversation with God, regardless of what you call it. We have the responsibility to take the reins of our own spiritual growth, our own walk with God, to step out in faithful Christian, uh, in a faithful Christian walk, to figure out how we give, where we give, to whom we give, or do we give at all? Folks, the uh, tithing, giving, maybe I'm making some people uncomfortable, maybe I'm making some people upset. Again, I ask for grace, because <clears throat> this is where I know that I feel, and I feel strongly in this, because I've talked this through, I've walked this through. This is where my heart lies. Folks, the idea of giving is an opportunity for you. It's an opportunity for everyone to be able to have a conversation with God. One of many opportunities to have a relationship with Him, because that's what He wants. To talk with Him and make a determination of what is giving to you and how do you do it? Where do you give it? Who do you give it to? And in what form does it come? So for me, in my little amount of research that I've done, I came to this place, this question, okay, great. I've got this wild epiphany of mine, hopefully not something that people feel is off the rails. How do I give? How do I give? In what manner do I give? Folks, there's about a thousand. <laughs> you can go right on the website. This is true. Um, how do I give? Folks, there's a list that you can find everywhere if you want to look up in Captain Google of how to give and where to give. What ways do I give? What are the principles of giving? I'm not going to throw you under the bus and give you all 100. I'm going to give you six. And these are six that I found that struck me the hardest and felt, I felt came to the very core of Christian giving, of, of godly giving, I guess would be the way to put it. So number one and number two, very simply, we give willingly and we give cheerfully. Now, I don't know, people on the internet out there, they can't throw their you know, hands up or put, uh, you know, throw out their voice to tell this, but I have a question for you. Put it in the comments. That's fine. Whether you're watching now or you're watching later. How many people have walked into a church at any point in their lives? And when the offering plate comes around or they start talking about the subject of giving, you felt a little awkward. You felt a little uh, not sure. You felt a little like, do I give? Do I not give? Especially when you walk into a new church. How do I give? How much do I give? I'm going to put it in the plate. The guy next to me sees how much I give. Is he... I'm going to raise my hand. I felt out of place. Willingly and cheerfully, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You give because you want to. You give because, one, you've had that conversation, and two, the Spirit moves you in your heart to give what it is that you feel that you can and what you have the ability to do. So that's number one and number two. Number three, secretly. That does not mean I want you sneaking into my house and putting in a ninja costume and putting money on my table or in the, in the tithing box. Chris has tried that. Didn't work. The dogs caught him. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. 
So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, but be honored by, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that you give, your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Folks, I think it's kind of plain to see, or to understand, but it's about God. In the immortal words of Dr. Phil, which is not me, it ain't about you. It's never about you. Not in your giving. It's never about you. The next one leads right into it. I love these two as well. Four and five, we give generously. Why would we not? Everything you have isn't even yours. If you really want to think about it, you're the steward of what you have been given. And you give generously back. And number five, unselfishly. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Got to say, in some of the research I did, this is probably one of those most maligned lines in the Bible that gets taken out of context. It's its own sermon, by the way. You can do a whole... I should write a sermon about that. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> My favorite one out of all of these at the end, number six. This gets people unconditionally. Unconditionally. Luke 17, 10. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We only have done our duty. Ever heard somebody, or heck, maybe even said it yourself, God, if you just give me this, then I'll, I'll, I'll go to church every day. It's not about giving necessarily, but it's the same aspect. Giving with an expectation of return. There's a condition attached to it. Folks, when you give money away with the expectation that you get something back, that's not giving, that's a loan. Without interest, hopefully. Folks, pretty sure that God's not a loan shark, okay? He's not here to loan. He's here to give. And so are you. <clears throat> There's a phrase in this uh, same bit of research that I did that, to me, kind of summed this, all of six of these, but probably could add a lot more into it as well, that Christians are called to generously give in response to the gospel of the Lord Jesus based on faith in God as a provider. God is the great provider. So it made me ask another question after that. Who do we give to? Where do we give to? Gentleman in the back in the shirt. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a lot of people that you can and probably should give to. That's what giving is about in the end. But there are three places that I found, three that I found the most impactful for me and hopefully maybe for you. Number one, we give to the poor. We give to those in need. Where did Jesus go? He went to the people that had need. He didn't go to the people that already had everything that they needed. That's a spiritual aspect of giving, I guess, but not the physical aspect, but everywhere we look, it's about going to the people who are poor, who have need. It's one of the fundamental aspects of what we are trying to do here at Victory Biker Church, Maine. Those that have need, whether it's physical need, spiritual need. Number two is one of my favorite ones. One I guess I never really thought of, or I have thought of, but not in this way, and so simple. Christian need. Acts 4, 32 through 35. It's a little long one. I apologize for its length. But Now the full number of those who believed 
were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him were his own. But they had had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. And right here, there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and bought the pro brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Chris, how many houses do you have? Four. Really? Are you sure? If you had need, do you think that you could come and use my house for your needs? Guess what, folks? Chris is a rich man. He has two houses. Ian, how many trailers do I have? The answer is zero. <laughs> he does know because just last week I came to him and I said hey Ian I might be looking for some a trailer to help me pull some plywood from that beautiful home despot guess what I have a trailer it's not mine I don't own it but it's there because everyone among us here are brothers and sisters in Christ we're Christians we're supposed to look out for each other we're supposed to give to each other. That's what this whole, and it's another aspect of what we've talked about. For those that have been here and been able to be at our Bible study, or our Bible studies and our talks, we talk about community. That was one of the fundamental things that drove me for, to, to, to do, not this, but Christian, uh, Victor Biker Church in the first place, is the idea of developing community. We start here. I mean, then we take it out there. If we can't do that here, how are the people out there going to emulate that or want to emulate that? Lastly, and there's no real particular order of these three, the work of the gospel, local church. That's us, by the way. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, now concerning the collection of the, for the saints. As I directed the churches of Galatia, um, Gla Galatia, sorry for my mispronunciation, again, new Christian. <laughs> so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. This is Paul. How do you think he got from one place to the other? His job was to go out and teach the gospel and teach, bring people to Christ. One place to the next. And take up a store so that when he comes, he doesn't burden himself, he finds a way to support himself, and then when he needs to move on to his next place, the church helps move him there. Think about missions. That's where missions are. We give to them so that they can go forth and be able to do the jobs that they want to do. For that matter, it's what we do when we give to the church so that the church can do what it needs to do. We talked about it last week. Chris made a great, great sermon about, and a great point about, you know, the church, one of its roles and responsibilities is things like hope. Well, how do you do that if you can't move yourself forward in any way? Got my timer up here. I'm 27 minutes in doing better than I expected. Trust me, the last time I did this, it was 45. You don't want to be here that long for me. I don't want to be that here that long for me. I want to leave a couple of last thoughts that I just, some read and some came to, and I think they're, they're not Bible quotes. They're just, I guess, quotes from people who've had a little more wisdom than I have. Generous giving is a tangible expression of our love for God. We talked about it a little bit earlier. We don't own the things that we have. We've been given them. We've been blessed. We hopefully have been blessed. Hopefully we recognize them as blessings. And hopefully we have that conversation with God to say, hey, I recognize that you've given these to me. Let me give back to you as an expression of my love for everything that you've given, including your life. 
a heart truly dedicated to Christ, a heart truly dedicated to Christ, cannot help but be generous towards God and his people. And the last one was one that was, well, I'm going to say it was mine. <laughs> it came to me, and this is the last bit. Giving freely and without expectation of gain further opens our heart to God to be more filled by him so that we may give even more. And by that, further open our hearts even more to God to be more filled by him so that we may, may give even more. <clears throat> Folks, I guess the one thing that I wanted to come down to, whether you fully agree with every piece that I've said, the one thing I would want you to do and walk away from, you leave here today, find a space. Find a place that's quiet. Find a place that brings the holy to you, brings the spirit. Have that conversation. God, what do you want me to do? Be prepared. Be prepared to hear the voice, his voice, quiet or soft. Listen for it. And then when you hear it, be prepared. You might be asked to give nothing. Probably not. It's going to go, but it's probably not. But you might just be asked to give everything. Because it's not really up to you. We bear the responsibility to take that step. If we're act within this new covenant of grace. If we have that freedom, then to have that conversation, be prepared. But take the step and have the conversation. So, let us pray. God, Holy Father, we know that you are the great provider. What we have before us was given by your hand. And we whole, hope that you open our hearts, open our minds, enter into us through the Holy Spirit. And show us what it is that we need to give and how and to whom. How much? How little? Open our hearts to bless others through our giving. Open our hearts to see the opportunity that we have when we give to be able to be closer to you. To be able to have a relationship that steps that one step further down that Christian walk that we voluntarily entered into. Help us to understand that we are your servants. In Jesus' holy name, amen.